All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining today's DreamWakers Daily Conversation. Today we're talking with Ariana Long, who is an astronomer in training at UC Irvine in Southern California with the goal of becoming a full-time scientist in observational astronomy. Ariana, thank you so much for being with us today and thanks for taking the time to answer our students' questions. Of course, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm excited for this format. I think it's it's really great. Yeah, we're really excited to introduce you to our community. We've got people far and wide joining us today um, via Facebook Live, and we would love to just know a little bit about you and your background, your career journey so far, in your own words. Yeah, um, I have a feeling we're going to get into some of this in detail, so I'll keep it brief. Um, so I'm in Irvine now in California, but I was originally born and mostly raised in Maryland, um, in Montgomery County. Um, I do miss it. My family is still back there. I went to undergrad at Towson University outside of Baltimore and I studied math. Um, I originally went to be a math educator but changed because I actually love the science part. Um, and then I moved out to California after that to try working um, in business and I didn't love it. Uh, I always knew I wanted to go back to school for something more science heavy. Um, and so, um, again, I think this will come up, but I ended up choosing astronomy. Um, it was something I'd always loved. I just didn't know was accessible. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here on this journey. I have a few more years um, in my P or two more years in my PhD program. And I really, really love it. Uh, I, hope, I hope I can stay doing this for the rest of my life. Yeah, I mean, you kind of touched on it, so I'll just let you take off. But one of our questions from a sixth grader in Georgia was, how did you decide you wanted a career in astronomy? What led you to that? Yeah, that was not a, like a very linear, like it wasn't a, an early decision. A lot of people do come into astronomy knowing that that's what they wanted to do as a kid, and that's wonderful. Um, for me, it was kind of all over the place. Uh, I knew I loved the stars and astronomy and, and things like that as a kid, but I didn't really even know it was a job. Um, <laughs> I just assumed it was something that we knew and that like, we just accepted it for what it was. Uh, and as I progressed through school and I was doing well in academics, um, you know, I learned a little bit about what you can do with science and math. But for the most part, to be honest, a lot of people, even though I was at the top of my classes in, um, in grade school, a lot of people just told me, oh, you're great in math, you're great in science, you should be a math or science teacher. Um, so that's kind of what I really focus on and I actually really do love teaching and that's um, a part of the career that I've chosen um, to be a professor you teach and do research um, but at the time I got fixated on sure okay I like this stuff then I guess I should teach it um, and then when I went to college as a to, to teach math um, you still are required to take uh, a lot of math classes including some like sciencey like applied math where you learn about physics and how you know planets orbit stars and maybe even how disease spreads that was something that was also interesting to me um, and I love those things and I found them really fascinating and slowly slowly like kind of through asking around I realized that that was an actual job that people did uh, being an astronomer um, but by the time I realized it was a little bit late uh, so I had to go and kind of get some more experience um, and learn more about it um, and that's how I ended up getting my journey but yeah it was it was more something that I loved. I just had no idea you could do it for a living. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, if you're interested in something, I definitely encourage you to really try to do some Googling and some research to figure out if it's possible to do that as yeah. a job. Or tune into Dreamwakers Daily and, and see exactly. people who are doing what they want to do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so I'm curious, I mean, obviously we're living in a kind of insane world right now. Things are very different. Um, and I'm curious, you're, I mean, you're in school, and so you're, that's your day-to-day, -day, um, and it's, has that changed with, with the pandemic? Has that changed working from home? What does that look like for you? Yeah, so I'm very, 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 very fortunate. Um, so I'm done with classes. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, the PhD journey, you usually take classes in the beginning, like your first couple years, and then you do research um, for a few more years, mm -hmm. just like investigating what you're interested in. And so I'm in that phase, uh, which is nice, so I don't have to attend any classes online. Um, but I'm also very lucky in that my science doesn't have an actual lab here on Earth. Um, my science is in space, and that means that most of what I do actually comes from like telescopes, and telescopes send really pretty pictures and data down through archives, which are online, 
Um, so all of my work actually can be done from a laptop. And I'm very fortunate. It's actually one of the reasons why I love this career. I could be anywhere in the world and I could still access my work. Um, I know not everybody has that luxury, but for me, it actually hasn't really slowed anything down. Cool. That's great to hear. Um, <laughs> So obviously you're in astronomy now. It took you a little while to get there, um, but I'm curious because the STEM field is often a very homogenous looking group of people. Um, so I'd love to talk a little bit more about what it's like to be a woman of color in a field that's dominated primarily by people who don't look like you. Um, and how have you overcome those challenges that that's presented? Yeah, that's a very, very real thing, um, especially in physics, like in particular in physics, I think it's one of the worst, or we compete with engineering in that way, and being like really homogenous, um, not women-centered or women of color at all, very few of us. Um, and in fact, it, in physics and astronomy in general, it's like less than 200 black women with PhDs in physics, and then if you condense it down to astronomy, it's like 20 or something like that. Um, so really, like you can really, we all know each other for the most part. Uh, <laughs> And so it's been, it's been a journey. Um, it isn't always easy. Um, part of it is definitely dealing with stereotypes, the metric for success in fields like this is built around a certain type of person. Um, and a lot of times uh, people like myself don't fit into that box. And so it's almost hard for me to kind of measure sometimes um, how, how to be, how I'm progressing because um, other than, you know, getting a degree and doing things like that that are really concrete, some things that people tell you to do is that you should be working these many hours or you should be traveling this much or you should be willing to move across the world to go pursue this job. And these are things that are more accessible to maybe someone who doesn't have a family or who isn't close with their family um, or, you know, you should look a certain way. This is a big one, too, with loud clothing, loud hair, uh, which I have. Uh, these are all things that stick out for sure, um, and they do make it more difficult uh, in many ways. Yeah, which leads into my next question, which you are my personal hair goals. <laughs> um, you have beautiful hair, Thank and I you. love it. Um, and I'm just curious, like, I, I know it's, I feel like hair is just a large part of identity, particularly for women of color, and I'm curious how that's played a role in your personal and professional life. Yeah, um, I was wondering who wrote that question. Thank you. Uh, of course, I had my hair twisted today. Um, so yeah, it's a uh, so yeah. I'll go a little more in depth into what I was saying in the previous answer. Yeah. So with hair and with clothes, basically, I mean, we stick out. I stick out in a, in a lot of these spaces because there are few people who look like me. And so on one hand, I'm dealing with a lot of um, like representation issues. Like I feel like I represent people in my culture or people who look like me, I can't really hide among the masses. Like if, if I ask a question and maybe I think it's a dumb question or I'm embarrassed by it, um, it's really easy to turn around and say, oh, that, that girl with the big hair, whereas um, some of my white male counterparts can kind of blend in um, and not be pinpointed for things like that. And so kind of this constant feeling of being seen um, can be exhausting, um, especially with hair. But on the flip side, um, again, in relation to one of my answers earlier, I also feel like a lot of these people can't possibly understand where I come from and what my goals are in relation to that. So my goal, I love mentorship. I love working towards representation. And these are things that a lot of these people haven't had to think about or um, try to work on. And so a lot of times I'll get advice from these people saying, well, maybe you shouldn't wear that or maybe you shouldn't do that one thing. Um, because it takes away from your science or this one metric that we think everybody should be doing to be successful. And I have to take a step back and say, okay, well, this person is trying to help me, but they can't possibly understand where I'm coming from. Um, I know me. I know my goals. I know what I care about. And so I need to sort of develop this filter of, of what's worthy of listening to and what isn't. And that even applies to my hair. Absolutely. That's such an important piece of advice. And no one else has had your life experience or can, can bring the things that you can bring. And that's still so valuable. Exactly. That. Um, so we actually had another sort of in a similar vein, um, a senior student from Youngstown, Ohio, submitted a question wanting to know if you had advice for young women who are interested in pursuing a career in STEM, specifically um, young women of color. But I mean, women generally, or just people who are minorities looking to be in a field where they might not have others to support that look like them. Yes. 
my advice is do it. Uh, <laughs> definitely do it, but it will, it, like, it will be hard. There will be moments of struggle, um, not just because of the way you look or who you are, but just because the material can be difficult. But that shouldn't sway you. Um, I think what makes a really good scientist in any capacity or any STEM field is someone who is like okay with uh, failing and learning and growing and practicing and trying again. And so if you're finding that maybe this one class is really hard or this one subject is really hard but you like it, then that's a good sign and that you're willing to keep trying and failing and learning it. Um, so that's one piece of advice. And the other one I have is, again, to just remember that when those moments do have where you maybe you feel different. I've been in the classroom, been the only woman, the only woman of color, the only black person. Um, I've been asked if I was in the right room. I've been accused of cheating when I got A's. Um, these are all things that definitely had to do with um, systemic racism and opinions and things like that. When those things happen, again, you have to remind yourself what's important to you um, and, and why you're doing what you're doing and why you love it. And also, again, that only you know you and only you know your goals um, as well as you do. Uh, and so it's important to develop this filter of, okay, this person is trying to help or this person was trying to hurt me, but they don't know me. Um, I know me and I know that I'm supposed to be here and that's what's important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so kind of pivoting a little bit again, we had a question from a sixth grade student in New Mexico who's wondering what your biggest obstacle is and how you overcame it. Yeah, I've thought a lot about this question. Um, it, it used to stop me when I started doing these classroom um, talks because there are lots of obstacles. But I think the biggest one for me was kind of over what everyone told me I should do and translating and figuring out what I wanted to do. And I'm, I know everybody grows up and their parents say, well, you should do this. You're going to die. You should be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer. You should do these things. Um, but growing up and being told you should be a teacher, you should be a teacher, you should be a teacher, it took me until I was in my 20s to really like figure out that that's not what I wanted to do. And I, I knew it, but I couldn't really move beyond that. So my biggest obstacle was, again, developing my own inner voice and listening to my inner voice um, on what makes me happy and what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. And once I did that, everything changed. I became a happier person. I was excited about things. Um, I was more engaged in life in general, but it took the majority of my life uh, to figure that out. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious, what is the most rewarding thing about what you do now? I mean, you seem to have found <laughs> the thing that you love, so that's amazing. What do you find to be most rewarding about that? Oh man, um, so this one's hard. So astronomy is difficult sometimes to convey to the public because it has direct and indirect impacts to humanity, but it's usually it's kind of hard to grasp what they are. And so um, sometimes this question is really difficult to answer because of that. But I would say the most rewarding part would be two parts. Uh, one is my favorite moment is when I solve something. So I'm writing some code to figure out a problem with my research or to try to see a new result or figure out something about the universe. And it could take me sometimes anywhere from a couple of days to there are other projects that have taken me a year. And that moment when you finally see the number that you see is just, is, is the best thing. <laughs> that is rewarding to me because it feels like I'm figuring out like a little piece of the universe. And I just think that's the coolest. That's amazing. Not having any astronomy <laughs> background, that excites me. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. <laughs> um, so I'm curious too about I mean, you, you found what you love, but were there people along the way who kind of encouraged you to take these chances? Like, have you, what's the role of mentorship been in your life? Yes, I'm very, very passionate about mentorship in general. Um, I actually helped develop a mentoring program in my community. I go to mentoring conferences. It's very important to me. And this is another piece of advice I have for someone interested in STEM, especially women of color. Um, mentors, I think, really, really are the only sometimes the only driving force in your life when you have these struggles going on that feel like they're out of your control. And yes, I've had women of color mentors and, and white women, white men, allies and mentors who have really played a role in my life and in many different ways. Everything from nominating me for scholarships um, and opportunities to network with other people 
um, to just being a place where I can go and vent about microaggressions or just being really upset about um, a grade that I got and feeling feeling like maybe that it was a sign that I didn't belong there. And going to these people who have gone through what I had been through um, but, are, but are now successful, they're able to tell me, look, I've been there and look where I am now and I believe in you and, and you can be there too. Mm-hmm. And so building that community and having that network of support, um, I really cannot emphasize how important that is. And just for those of you who are listening, a mentor doesn't have to be um, you know, a boss or something like that. A lot of your teachers are mentors, a lot of your counselors are mentors. Um, some of your older siblings or your parents' friends are your mentors. Just look out for those people who are really trying to support you and who want to help connect you um, and get you closer to your goals. Absolutely. That's amazing advice, and it's so important, especially for all the young people out there listening. Um, so we're almost out of time. I know it flew by, but um, I would love to just leave this conversation with a couple of takeaways. What do you hope that people watching take from this conversation after today? Yeah. Um, oh, wow. Okay. So a couple of takeaways. One would be, I'm going to reiterate it again because I think it's really important, is only you know yourself and what's important to you. Um, and if you have other people telling you that that's not important or you shouldn't focus on that or you shouldn't spend your time on that, then that should be a red flag that you know maybe that's not the person to talk to about those things and that maybe maybe you need to find another mentor for that area because ultimately whatever you want is valid and true and and good for you um, and you should pursue those things that make you happy. Um, so that kind of ties in mentorship with um, being different and having different goals in different spaces. Um, and I think my other piece of advice would just be in general, even outside of STEM spaces, just get comfortable with failing and get comfortable with being uncomfortable and learning things. Uh, because in general, in life, you're going to have to learn to grow, and it's really uncomfortable sometimes. Um, but the sooner you can get comfortable with that, it's just like learning a new skill in a sport, um, the better you can grow and the faster you can grow in whatever it is you want to do. Amazing pieces of advice and a great way to end things. Um, Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you being a part of the conversation. Thank you so much for having me. I really love what y'all do. Thank you. And everyone watching, thank you so much for being here today for our Dreamwakers Daily Conversation. You can join us every single day at 1 o'clock here on Facebook Live. And if you miss them live, you can always watch them later. They'll be posted on our page after they air. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye. Awesome. Thanks.